We welcome all of you tonight, most particularly of you who are, have joined us on live stream. We're in the book of Amos. This will be our third uh, lesson in it. There's a perspective in Amos you do want to pick up on. For some, this may not be a, a pleasant book. But part of being in Christ is you have to learn not to, to eat more than just pleasant food. We happen to be in a living in a time when you have to learn to eat some hard things. Now, prior to Christ, God basically revealed his wrath against sin. That kind of is the basic thing. There were some glimpses of his grace. He's introduced his mercy, but they far and few between. I say far and few between. There were sometimes centuries where there wasn't any display, open display of the mercy of God. And God confirmed his attitude towards sin and sinners, whether they be many or whether they be few. Now, when there was only two people in the entire world God set an exclamation mark about what he thinks about sin. They were the only perfect people that ever lived. There never has been any sense. They only sinned one time, and they had to leave the habitat. Then on the other extreme, you see an entire world engulfed in sin. In Noah's day, and God destroyed the entire thing. See, God's making a statement in these matters. There have been whole cities that were destroyed because they were sinful. Yep. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adbam, Zeboam, Babylon, Jerusalem, and some others are mentioned in Scripture. The words sin and sins, words sin and sins occur 367 times in Moses and the prophets. He's hammering about those things. Or transgression and transgressions, they're mentioned 89 times. Or iniquity and iniquities, this is in Moses and the prophets, are mentioned 294 times. The wicked and the wicked and wickedness are mentioned 431 times. Sin is never mentioned in the context of divine tolerance and indifference. Does it make a difference? One sin, a multitude of sins, one person, a lot of people, it's never set in the context of divine tolerance and forbearance. Never. Sin is never condoned, not so much as one time. It's never in any way approved, never in any way sanctioned, never in any way recommended. God consistently represents himself as against sin, hating sin, and opposed to the sinner. This is a consistent representation. I mean, if you miss this, you just haven't read the Bible. Just that cut and dry. So read it. You'll see it's there if you haven't. Yet to this very day, at this very moment that I'm speaking, there are countless professing Christians that have a lot of trouble receiving that God can't stand sin and he's not going to tolerate sinners. Amen. It's a still a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow. There's arguments about this. People don't want to admit it. They just want to leave you thinking, oh, God feels sorry for sinners. No, he doesn't feel sorry for sinners. I'm sorry. He has compassion, but not that they stay sinners. He has offered a solution to sin. And he's going to damn everybody that doesn't accept it. I'm telling you the truth. This is just straight out now. If you've learned to live with sin, you'll never learn to live in heaven. Yeah. It's the way it is. You say, well, that sounds pretty strong. Well, it needs to sound pretty strong. you got sin all around you, what kind of message are you going to do? Why do you deliver to a situation like this? Amos is telling you. Amen. He's telling us. The whole economy of salvation, 
boiled down, is intended to resolve the dilemma of sin, to destroy the guilt and the power of sin. That's what salvation is all about. Why? Because that's the only way man can have concourse with God. God's nature will not allow him, will not allow him to stand face to face with sinners. He's got to have a go-between. There's got to be a mediator. There's got to be somebody between God and man. That's how holy God is. Thank God he's provided it in Christ Jesus. So we must realize that sin and sinners clash with God. Now, here's where the prophets can have an indispensable ministry to us. They, they, may, they talk a lot about this. Fortunately, this isn't the kind of gospel we preach. We don't preach the gospel of sin, you know. Yeah. But, but you've got to know about sin to have, attach any value to Christ and salvation. If you don't know about sin, Jesus will just be like a friend. Friend in need is a fr friend in need is a friend indeed. That's kind of how you'll view him if you don't see this matter. So it'll bring you uh, to a very keen awareness of the need for Christ. And then there's the good news that, that that need is answered. God has brought Christ within our range, so to speak, so we can get hold of him and deal with this matter of sin. Now, Amos, that's what he's dealing with. We're going to be in the third verse tonight, Amos 1, 3. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. <laughs> well, we're going to find out some things here, I'll tell you. Thus saith the Lord. That phrase, thus saith the Lord, is mentioned 415 times in Scripture. The truth of the matter is God, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the only God that speaks. No other God speaks. Whether we're talking about intellectual God or we're talking about a statue. It is said of all false gods, they have mouths, but they speak not. That's Psalms 115, verse 5, and Psalms 135, 16. All false gods have mouths, but they don't speak. To this day, every body of people that is created their own God, he hasn't given them a, a message to deliver. Yes, None of these people have a message. No false gods have a message yeah. from their God. Some of them have a prophet that they say is given, but they're not a message yeah. from their God. None. <laughs> None of them have a word from their God that is accompanied with power. Uh, something just the things to think about. Mm -hmm. None of them have a book comprised of his sayings. Mm -hmm. yeah. This doesn't exist anywhere. Right. The sayings of Allah. Mm -hmm. The sayings of Balaam or Bala Baal. Mm -hmm. The sayings of Ashtaroth. Mm -hmm. yeah. The sayings of Sus Susanna of the Ephesians. Mm -hmm. No such thing. There's no such thing. Why? Because they don't speak. Yeah. Their gods don't speak. So we say, thus saith the Lord. We've narrowed things down yes, amen. to amen. one personality. The word of the Lord is so authoritative that men are going to be judged by it. Yes. Amen. He said, the word I have spoken unto you, the same shall judge you in the last day. So God's word, see, there's coming a day, more than a day, the day of judgment, when God's going to be true and every man's a liar, 
And he's going to be justified. He's going to, God's going to be justified by the men that judged him. Everybody who disagrees with God has judged him. Amen. Yeah. So the day of judgment is going to point out that not in, not in a single instance will God be found untrue. Yeah. So when we read, thus saith the Lord, we, we perk up. Amen. Other versions say this is what the Lord says, or these are the words, or here is what he said, something to that effect. The language is that of specificity. Thus saith the Lord. It's just not like a general statement isn't what follows. Something specific. This is precisely what the Lord said. When I spoke from the text in 1 Timothy 4 where Paul says, the Spirit expressly says. Expressly says, that's right. Statements like that throughout That's the right. He pinpoints it. Mm -hmm. Why? Before you can ever be advantaged by God, what he says has to be pointed and specific, yeah. not general. There are summations of divine utterance, but there are summations of specific yeah, that's right. utterances. Thus is a word, thus saith the Lord, thus is a word that precedes something that is precise. Thus, and it's very, very precise what follows. This is not what Amos thought Jesus said yeah. or God said. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is not Amos's view about what he thought God meant. Because mm -hmm. no scriptures have any private interpretation. Amen. What that means is whatever God showed or told the prophets, what they wrote down was not what they thought God meant. Yeah, that's right. Like the Bible translators do. Yes, with the with Judah. The specificity of God's words is very. You can see it very well in the books of the Old Covenant, especially where He's giving the instructions for the tabernacle and the sacrifices and the building of the tabernacle itself. Yeah. And we've been we've been going through this, you know, scripture time at home, and it's like. You read this verse, and then you have to go through verse by verse and really study it to see what he's saying because he gets so specific. Yeah, right. And Moses had to be, he, God had to give Moses grace to say all this because he said, tell this to the people. And then Moses had to listen. He probably wrote it, and then tell it to the people. And there couldn't be one jot or one tittle not kept. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he didn't... Sh show them a picture of the tabernacle and say, do your best now to yeah. make a building like this. Yeah. Spelled it out. Yes. God, God showed these things unto Amos knowing that when God, told, when God would tell him something, Amos wouldn't try to put his own view on it. That's story. right. Mm -hmm. He knew that Amos was faithful. Yeah. Prophets were faithful. Amen. The fact that... Uh, Thus saith the Lord is definitive in nature, means that it tends to clarify whatever it's whatever thing it's addressing, it'll clarify it. Whereas man may have muddied the waters or personal thinking might be nebulous or but for thus saith the Lord, that like is a light. It's a beam of light that clarifies the situation. Because in Amos day the the people didn't think the kind of condition that Amos is going to outline in this book existed. Mm -hmm. yeah. The priests thought everything were going along pretty good. Mm -hmm. Praise services were good. Mm -hmm. God come down, he said, it's not good. I can't stand a noise. You got some mighty fancy sound and music there, but I, I hate it. Yeah. Get it away from me. Mm -hmm. See? But the, this is not how it appeared. It appeared on the surface as though things were going along pretty good. So, thus saith the Lord, clarifies. Either it clarifies what God is against, or it clarifies what he's for, one or the other. Actually, every word of God is like this. This is precisely what the Lord says. 
what we're going to read is it, precisely what the Lord said. It's not a summation of what he said. Men are not to tamper with what God says. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. All right, leave it alone. Don't yeah. Leave it alone. Leave it like it is. Mm -hmm. And God was very specific about this. Under the law, he said, concerning what he said about the law, which was a lot. You know, he said a lot. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the door. Keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Don't, don't, don't mess with this. Again, he said to them in Deuteronomy 12, 32, What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto or diminish from it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't modify it. <laughs> I'll throw some other word in there. All Satan did is add one word, thou shalt not surely die. He just added one word. But you know what happened from that. <laughs> then John, in testifying the revelation, which book has been tampered with more probably than any other yeah. book of the Bible? That's right. Well, people really went to work yeah. on the book of Revelation. But here's what the book of Revelation says about the book of Revelation. It's found in Revelation 22, 18. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And there are some plagues, let me tell you. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's how serious God is. And as I say, there's a... Thousands of books been written about Revelation with strange quirks in them. There's a lot of laxness in professing Christians concerning this matter. The Word of God just isn't being honored like it should be. There are people that do. I'm not talking about the remnant. I'm not talking about the faithful. I'm saying that they're in the vast major minority. Right. It's not uncommon to find professing Christians consulting with everyone but God mm -hmm. on things God has addressed. Amen. I receive hundreds of emails every day of about 800 every day. I got to sort through them. A lot of them are worthless. But the amount of marriage counselors is mind-boggling. All these nutcases have answers for all the trouble in marriage, and yet we got more trouble in marriage than we ever had before. Amen. You'll find this is, this is a pattern. The problems men tend to address the most are the problems that are the most serious and continue to be most serious. See, what I'm saying is, men ask God if they do at all last. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's to be the first one you seek, the first one you ask, not the last. If you're sick, I speak as a person who has a little bit of understanding of this, you don't wait till all the doctors have given their diagnosis to pray. You're the last people you should go to. And I don't mean waiting around. I mean take this matter to the Lord. Everyone that studied the scriptures have had this happen to them. They've, they've, they've seen a scripture and it's ministered in a certain way and they've come back six months later and it's, and it's the same words, but it ministers in a different way. <laughs> now that should teach you that you can't modify it be, and, yeah. and to Amen. your advantage because what you're doing is you're you're fitting it for your circumstance all right maybe today it'll help you a little but what about six months from now when the circumstances change you need the pure undiluted word mm -hmm. to do with the work that's right it, well when you water it down and you make it into a commentary you're fitting it for for an for a, you see what I'm saying? Oh, yes. it, it, you, you, it, it's not going to be effective then. Yeah, as soon as you as soon as you add something to the Word of God, 
it is not the word of God anymore. Amen. Now, let me give you an example of how people neutralize the word of God. God is a very present help in the time of trouble, but we just don't seek him like we should. All right, now that last sentence neutered the word. That word isn't going to do squat. Yeah, uh -huh. That means nothing. Yeah. It's not going to do anything now uh -huh. because that was added. And if you listen, mm -hmm. you'll be staggered at how much people talk just precisely like this. I know we all ought to trust the Lord, but you know, we're only human. Well, we're only human. That made a cesspool yeah. out of the, what you thought was the word. Yeah, See, right. you can't. Yeah. That's adding to it. Uh -huh. yeah. If God tells you Sin not, which he says three times in the New Covenant writings. Sin not, don't say, but I'm just human. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because then the word has no power. But if you take that word ser seriously, uh -huh. it has power to keep you from sinning. Amen. That's right. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. Other versions say, Thus saith Jehovah. Jerusalem, uh, the uh, Jewish Bible says that Adonai, Yahweh, and God's, the message Bible doesn't even bring God, it says God's message, what it says. The word Lord, all in uppercase letters in Scripture, is the word, Jewish word Yahweh, Yahovah, which we say is Jehovah. It's the name, it's the name Jehovah, all in capital letters. It, uh, it follows from the Jewish sensitivity. The Jews were, were afraid to spell God's name out because they were afraid they might make a mistake. So they abbreviated it, Yah. One place the Psalms called them Yah. <laughs> they it abbreviated. And this, the English translators followed the same thing at first before they got real bold. They, they were afraid, uh, just to use capital L, capital O-R-D, that's, that's what we'll play. That means Jehovah is what it means. Now, this is God's name, Jehovah. And when God appeared to Moses, he commented about this. His words are very resting. They're found in Exodus 6, 2, and 3. This is part of the burning bush experience. God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, there it is, yeah. Jehovah. I appeared unto Abraham and Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, mm -hmm. which is El Shaddai. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a key. Uh, <laughs> it's a, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob now. They knew God as the Almighty. He didn't tell him his real name, Jehovah. That's, he didn't even tell him that. He had to educate the people for a long time before they could, he, could, he could reveal this utterance. The word Jehovah means the unchanging, self-existent God. Another way of saying, I am that I am. When you think of me, I've just always been. Mm -hmm. You can't think of a time or a period when I wasn't. Yeah. I am. That I am. That's who thus saith the Lord. That's who says this. The one who speaks says from eternity. Mm -hmm. See, God's words are part of him. Amen. It's his nature speaking. Yeah. God has no opinions. So sometime I've heard people say that. I think they just haven't thought it out. But I you know, think, we don't know, in your opinion, God has an opinion. God doesn't have an opinion. That's a, that's a human thing. It's not, God doesn't have opinions. He sees things as they are. Amen. And he speaks as the one that you can't add anything to him and you can't take anything from him. That's in the capacity he speaks. He speaks in the capacity of one that knows everything, has always been. He speaks of that capacity. He doesn't speak with like the local situation in mind. Yeah, that's right. 
He speaks as from eternity. Now, when he speaks something, his word is the final word on any subject he addresses. On any subject he addresses, his word is the final word on the subject. Everything is accountable to him. Everything. Whether a person is cognitively acquainted with God, as he's acquainted with God and he knows it, or not, he's obligated to hear God's word. Amen. Hear meaning it's perceive, recognize. Amen. His creation is responsible to him. Even if it's a fig tree that's supposed to bear fruit, if it doesn't, it's responsible to God for not doing it. Yeah, yeah. Amen. See? Yeah. This is the God who now speaks. As the, as the psalmist said, Let all the earth fear the Lord, and let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Of him. Stand there like they did at Sinai, all those rumblings and warrings and a tempest and hail and water and fire and smoke, earthquake. Well, I tell you, everybody's paying close attention. Mm -hmm. See, why doesn't God do that today? He's already said too much about this to have to do this again. He could. He could do this. He could, like, shake down half a job. And, well, maybe he did do something like that. Come to think of it. Yeah. Habakkuk said this, Let all the earth keep silence before him. When God starts to speak, be quiet. Amen. God has revealed that he will focus his eye on the person. Isaiah 66, 2 says, He will focus his eye on the person that trembles at my word. When it comes across you that God said that, there's a there's kind of an inner, sometimes it'll shake you up outwardly, sober you up right away. So this is the word from God, thus saith the Lord. For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away from the punishment thereof. Now we're, we're being acquainted now with God and specificity. <laughs> God gets down to the details of sin here for three transgressions. He's going to tell you what they are, too. These are the same words in this book for three transgressions and for, I will not turn away the points, but this is repeated several times. It's repeated to Gaza, Tyrus, Edom, Ammon, Moab, Judah, and Israel. The same words precede what he says to, says to them. Now, divine examination gets down to the matter of deeds. Yeah. What you do. God looks on the heart. I understand that. He, he checks the motives. He looks on the motives. <coughs> but he considers the deeds. Mm -hmm. Through Jeremiah, God said the Lord... I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Uh -huh, amen. That's that phrase, fruit of his doing. The result of what he did is found numerous times in Scripture. In her insightful prayer to God, Hannah said, Talk no more exceedingly proud, exceeding proudly let not arrogancy come out of your mouth for the Lord is the God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed Amen. God weighs what men do then they excuse it God weighs what you do he evaluates it what you do how you express yourself Jesus said, I will reward every man according to his works. He revealed to John that the dead and every man will be judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Revelation 20, 
12 and 13. Now I want to assure you, I want to assure you that this is true. Whatever you may think about grace, mercy, kindness, forgiveness, whatever you think about those things, he judges deeds. To avoid the judgment for deeds, the deeds have to be taken out of the books. It's our forgiveness. Amen. Adam and Eve were judged because of what they did. Mm -hmm. Not what they thought, what they did. Yeah, right. Ate the fruit of the mm -hmm. forbidden tree. Cain was judged because of what he did. Mm -hmm. Murdered his brother. The world of Noah's days was judged because of what it did. Mm -hmm. Violence filled the face of the earth. <coughs> Sodom and Gomorrah were judged because of what they did. <coughs> Their sin is very grievous. Nadab and Abihu were destroyed by fire because of what they did. They offered strange fire. Ananias and Sapphira were judged because of what they did. They lied about how much they gave. Jerusalem was judged because of what it did. It didn't accept Christ. It rejected him. Herod was struck dead because of what he did. He received the glory of God to himself. Mm -hmm. God judged some in Corinth with sickness mm -hmm. and death because they acted inappropriately at the Lord's table. Yeah. Now I've showed you in those few examples that before the law, during the law, and after the law, God judged people because of what they did. Yeah. <coughs> he still does this now. Jesus hasn't changed this. That's right. The reason for salvation is we've got to get rid of what you did. Amen. This, thing, this doing has to be addressed some way. Yeah. Well, it says Jesus took our, God laid all our iniquities upon him. He laid on him what you did. Yeah, that's right. It's what you did that was laid upon Christ. What you did, what you expressed mm -hmm. was laid upon him. All right, this is how... This is God's manner then. Mm -hmm. So now he dresses Damascus, which is a city, not a Jewish city. This is not a Jewish city. Mm -hmm. This is a city was a capital of Syria. And it's one of the most ancient cities existing to this very day. Mm -hmm. We got cities a hundred years old. There's cities in the world that are thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. Nineveh, Damascus, these are thousands of years old cities. Damascus, not located in Canaan. God had no covenant with Damascus. He didn't give any law to Damascus. There was no prophet sent to Damascus. God had, has a controversy with Damascus. Damascus is first mentioned in an incidental way in Genesis 14, 15. Abraham's servant Eliezer, he was from Damascus. And Damascus is called by Isaiah the head of Syria. We call it the capital mm -hmm. of Syria. All of this confirms that this city was under the watchful eye of the Lord without a law, without a covenant, without a prophet. Mm -hmm. God's watching this city. I say that because, see, and I come from a background where they taught this, that the law was given only to Israel. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is really responsible to God. See, oh, thank God for being delivered from ignorant people. Amen. This is a great deliverance. Yeah. He had his eye on Damascus. <laughs> for three transgressions, yea, for four. All right, that three, even for four, that is compared with James' expression, superfluity of naughtiness. That is, it, o it overflowed. It went to extreme, mm -hmm. or about a, iniquity being full, filling up mm -hmm. the cup. That's that's what the yay for means. Things overflowed. Uh -huh. I, I, this is God tells Amos, you got to tell us to Damascus now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you tell him, I'm, I'm not turning away from the punishment. <laughs> Other versions say, I'm not going to revoke this. I'm not going to turn back. Damascus had crossed the line of divine tolerance, and God won't change his mind on this like he did Nineveh. Yeah. 
He changes my Nineveh. This isn't like that. I'm not going to turn, turn away from this. There are going to be no more warnings. You've had enough warnings now. They'd receive judgment from the Lord. Now there's a language in Scripture that tells you God's like this. There's some kind of a line. We don't know what it is or where it is. But some type of line, it, it becomes impossible mm -hmm. to renew a person to repentance. Yeah. Yeah. This is Hebrews 6.6. 6. There is a sin that's committed mm -hmm. for which there's no sacrifice. Yeah, right. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Mm -hmm. There is a sin that Christ's death doesn't cover. You thank God it's, it's not a common. Yeah. But it is one. No more. There's no more sacrifice. See, in other words, you can spurn Christ's death so long. Or in the case of the prophets, you can spurn God's warnings mm -hmm. so long until God says something like this, which he said to Jeremiah no less than three times, do not pray for this people. Yeah. It was Israel. He went on to tell them, if you pray, I will not listen. Don't. No more prayers. No more prayers. When Judas went out and betrayed Jesus, no more prayers. If there ever were prayers for Judas, no more. Not after that. Not after that, there wasn't. No more. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, Paul said. Paul said, don't you pray for, pray for Alexander. He didn't say that. He said the Lord reward him according to his works. Yeah, yeah. Crossed the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people don't know there's a God like this. Yeah. But we should know this. We, we're, we don't want to tempt God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Why not? Ah, this is one reason why right here. Don't provoke him. There are the... I will not turn away the punishment thereof, which means the punishment is for this, for this condition. My word concerning this condition is judgments appointed to Damascus. It's a specific judgment for a specific city, and I'm not going to recant. I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to change my mind. Uh, because, <clears throat> other versions read four. The word... Because means according to or accordingly or because by reason of. I'm going to tell you now why I'm not going to change my mind on this. Now, it's important to know this because God always does things for a cause, whether it's blessing or cursing. There's a cause that drives it. It's not an emotion that drives God's blessings or judgments. It's not like a reflective, spontaneous mm -hmm. yeah, right. response. Mm -hmm. There's a cause. He said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 14, 23, Ye shall know that I have done nothing without cause. I have done not done without cause all that I have done, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. Or the Amplified Bible reads, Then you shall understand and realize that I have not done without cause all that I have done. There's a reason why I did it. So if God actually does all things, all things are of God. Should there be a wind in the city and tumult in the city and I haven't done it? But if he did it, there was a reason why he did it. Now here's the cause. Damascus. They threshed Gilead, which was part of Israel. You treated my people rough. You crushed them, thrashed them. One verse said, you sawed them, you ripped through them, you beat down my people at Gilead, you trampled them down, you pounded Gilead in a, into a pulp, the Message Bible says. Now, the activity that took place was actually God punishing Israel. And he refers to this 
in 2 Kings 10, when this judgment we're talking about actually took place, this king is mentioned both here and in, the, in this text. There in the reign of Jehu, it says Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of God of Israel with his whole heart. He departed from this he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made which made Israel to sin. God in punishing them, the language he uses is uh, very resting. Second, in Second Kings, it says he began. He cut short Israel. That's how the text reads. He cut short Israel. Some of the other verses say he began to cut off portions of Israel. The NIV says he began to reduce the size of Israel. So this is through this through Damascus through this event that we're reading about here through that event God was cutting Israel down to size because of its sin. And God sent King Haziel, king of Syria, to do this work. I want, want you to really see this that he's he chased Israel. He sent the Syrians down there to do it under they came out of Damascus, the capital city, and Haziel was the king. They did it with sharp threshing instruments of iron. In other words, it say implements of sharp iron. In IV says sledges having iron teeth. Basic Bible says iron uh, grain crushing instruments. With an iron spike threshing sludge sledge. They sawed with iron saws the women with children of the Galadites. I'm going to show you where they got that. They sawed with saws by iron the ones in the womb. They dragged logs with spikes over them. Now Haziel, the king who did this, and who is mentioned in this passage in Amos, Haziel by name is mentioned. Before he did this, there was a prophet of God that told him what he was going to do, and Hazel didn't think himself capable of doing it. And here's what the prophet told him. It's found in 2 Kings 8, 12. I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and will dash their children and rip up their woman, women with child. Pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. I don't know how the United States of America is going to manage to escape yeah. this kind of thing. That's right. yes. I'm very concerned about it, and I'm sick and tired of all the sloppy talking about it. Yeah. I'm tired of hearing people say, if my people call by my name, will pray. Yeah. I'm tired of hearing people misuse that text. That's right. This isn't God's land. This isn't God's country. Let's be clear about it. This isn't what it is. God hasn't pledged to underwrite America. He did pledge to underwrite Israel. So, it's, so I'm really weary of hearing people abuse Scripture because they're so, they're so stinkingly patriotic. Patriotism will kill you. They'll take you from God. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah, you against it? Pert and near. Not all the way, but I'm getting, I'm pretty about as close as you can get. And it also says that Haziel oppressed Israel during all the days of Jehoahaz. That's 2 Kings 13, 20. That's a period of 17 years. Estimated to be. The Chronicles record these heart-rending words referring to a similar occasion that the Chaldeans punished Judah. See, this was against Israel, that the Chaldeans punished Judah. It's found in 2 Chronicles 36, 17. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans who slew the young men of the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young men or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. God did this. Yeah. I said, God did this. But, Hazel went too far. 
he went too far. Like Nebuchadnezzar, he did too. He went too far. He carried it too far. Now Amos announces that Damascus is going to be punished for what Israel did, who was punishing Israel according to God's will. <laughs> but he went too far. It'll be said of him as it was said of Babylon the Chaldeans, the Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. God saw, oh, Hazel, you did like Nebuchadnezzar. You went too far. When speaking of the invading Chaldeans under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar, Habakkuk spoke this book about this matter in pretty vivid language about going beyond. He said, then shall the mind, his mind, he is being Nebuchadnezzar, then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend imputing this his power to his God. What did he mean? There was a line that Nebuchadnezzar crossed over. He did more to Israel than he was ordained to do. Amen. And then he imputed his power to his God, and that did it. Yeah. That did it. Mm -hmm. So God, gonna, God punished Nebuchadnezzar because he did that. Yeah. God, through Amos, is going to tell Hazel, I'm punishing you because you went further than you should have gone. Now, there have been uh, times in my life, younger life, when I know that I'd been delivered to the tormentors. You know, Jesus said, well, be careful you're not delivered to the tormentors. And I was delivered to the tormentors and raked over the coals. And... But I found out later they went too far. They went too far. Because well into it, I repented of my doings. Yeah. Uh -huh. But they kept up. Some of them are still pursuing me. Yeah. Lying about me. Mm -hmm. Trying to misrepresent me. Mm -hmm. Still, you know. Almost 60 years after this stuff occurred, they're still... <coughs> went over, went too far. Yeah. What do you do when something like that happens? <coughs> You wait on the Lord Amen. because the Lord saw this. Right. Yeah. He saw this. Now, this is the kind of judgment that God's announcing through Amos. He's announcing judgment on a heathen city and a heathen king who he used to punish his people, but they went too far. Thinking that they had the power themselves to do it. And God did this to the previous nations. What did the Egyptians? They went too far. They oppressed Israel too much. Did it to the Midianites and Amalekites and Philistines and Syria. They, they chastened God's people, but they went too far. Now, among other things, brethren, this confirms to us a sensitivity of God. Only God can be so angry against sin that he sends someone like it's out to punish the people, but he maintains yeah. this sensitivity mm -hmm. that he crushed. But these people crushed mm -hmm. God's people, so it was hard to hope. God didn't intend for hope to be destroyed. Yeah, that's right. Amen. So he, he caused some of this to cease, you see. He caused it to stop, but this is something you can learn about God in Scripture, see. God is serious about punishing sin, but not so serious that he forgets mercy. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Amen. And sometimes your enemies will have to pay for the disrespect, thoughtless words, inconveniences, hurts. You can't settle it. And don't, don't try. Don't avenge yourself. You can't take the matter into your own hands, but God's going to see to it that this stuff is all righted. Amen. This is the way God is. Yes. And when you're willing, it like lifts a tremendous burden off your... To be vindictive, 
saps the soul. Because yeah, right. God doesn't intend for his people mm -hmm. to be vindictive. He didn't intend for Israel not to organize an army and go out and duke it out with these enemies later. Mm -hmm. He thought, I'll, I'll take care of this. Because yeah. I'll be able to administer justice in a proper, proper way. Amen. Well, that'll introduce us to this... Uh, <laughs> Starts out with Damascus. How about that? He's not going to mean he's going to mention Judah and Israel, but he's, after he's mentioned all these others, he's first going to mention them. I think I'll close there. And if you have a word you'd like to add, Mr. Barb. I'm thankful that the Lord does give very specific words because they're easy to get a handle on. The yes. More, the more general something is, the harder it is to take hold of it because there isn't. Mm -hmm. a handle so to speak to take a hold of it but the Lord when he speaks very specific it's like it gives it substance yep. it's solid mm -hmm. and so you can take hold of it firmly and be able to handle it then. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen Judah? We were speaking there just before you ended here that's God remembering mercy in his wrath so it's just even though he sent he's the one who sent the punishment it doesn't change the fact that they crossed over the line like that, like that answer, they went too far. They That's didn't right. do what they were ordained to do. They overdid it. That's right. So even in his wrath, God remembers mercy. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, what you said that people um, just say that they are human. Uh, we are not just human. We have a spirit. That's right, Amen. Sister yeah. Sarah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's exactly right. Amen. We're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's, That's right. The Bible Amen. says it. Same thing. Amen. Amen. Others tonight? Yes. Did you? Yeah. It mentioned that how that the Lord used Ezekiel and Nebuchadnezzar, different ones at times, to judge his people. All men, uh, they can. God directs all the nations. But they're still all responsible to him. That's and right. At some point, mm -hmm. they were, because of their nature, it's kind of like turning them loose and letting them do what they naturally would do. But whenever they stepped over, then the judgment of God was upon them. Mm -hmm. For they're still accountable to God, is what I'm Amen. saying. Mm -hmm. The people were of you know, God were accountable to Him, but just because you're a heathen doesn't mean you're not. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Yeah. This is demonstrated in the Gentile world, you remember? Mm -hmm. They were given a sparse amount of revelation and testimony of creation, but they refused to retain God in their knowledge and crossed over the line. God gave them over. Mm -hmm. The bad lusts. Mm -hmm. That's where the sin of sodomy began. The sin of sodomy resulted from divine abandonment. Yes. Amen. That's right. And it still does. Yeah. Yes, Brother Jonathan. You know, with you talking about judgment and even the state of our own country, now it's just a mercy that we haven't been delivered to punishment of this sort. Ourselves did bring some things to my attention, because I don't know the recent update on the matter, but there is a country who currently has vowed to yeah. nuclear, I know a it. nuclear strike on our country, and this was exactly what I thought about as yes. I read that report, like just like what we're going through in Amos. That's right. So it's definitely a good reminder that... the. Yeah, have to be in right standing with God. That's right. You say, what can I do? God will consider, listen, a remnant can yeah. save the people. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. A remnant can do it. That's right. For the remnant's sake. Yeah. Exactly. The days will be cut short. That's right. That's you going right. to say something, Brother Bob? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, Brother Jonathan. Um, I, I can remember thinking, it, people, the, the, people that they want to defend America and say, well, now, wait a minute. This is, it was founded on God and all this... They don't. They forget Israel. They forget that when when Israel turned away, God punished them. Now, wouldn't you think? I mean, do you, can you really say that America hasn't gone away? Hasn't turned yeah. against God? Yeah. And actually, for the most part, they're uh, as a nation, they're haters of God. That's right. It's just the way it is. I mean, yeah. you you have to lie to or not live here. To not know it. In other countries, view us, they laugh at us. Remember it said that Jeroboam made Israel sin. Yes. We got the same situation. Yes, right. He didn't make them sin by sending an army out and making them sin. Right. He led them in that direction. 
This country is being led in that direction by its leaders. It is not an innocent matter. Uh, uh, people give themselves to, to all, almost all entertainment. But see, the prince of the power of the air is Satan. And so who is writing all these scripts and who is writing all and, 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 and putting little things in these things that people are sitting there watching and they're saying they're trying to make people on the show feel bad if they if they have if you're against sodomy and, and, and they, they sympathize. What, what does that do? I say, well, I don't agree with that. But you sit and watch it. And it, what is it doing? It's molding the way you think. Exactly and they, right. they, don't, they don't realize it. But you look at all these old shows like, you know, and, and down in the 30s and 40s and 50s, they started putting, you know, it was, it was good triumphs over evil. Well, it doesn't now. It doesn't. I mean, and now it's like the evil, actually, th th they could try to disprove God. and dis <coughs> It's like they take Christianity apart, take God apart in these shows, and they, they looks like, that, like they can do it. It just looks like it. Yeah. But what's it doing? It's, it's making people think a way yeah. that's, that's warped. And, and anyway, I, I just I, I noticed that about about this the entertainment world. It, 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 they put a slight slant on everything to where it's not true. But in Hollywood, it can be true because they say so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jason? Yeah, I got just a couple of impressions from the from this as a whole. One is, the most important thing you can do is maintain your sensitivity to God's Word. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Um, if you read the history of Israel, uh, they, were, they were constantly uh, disobeying the Word of God. At, at Sinai, God spoke to them, and there was no doubt it was God speaking, mm -hmm. and it scared them, but then as soon as it stopped, they mm -hmm. made a golden calf. Yes, sir. <laughs> and then Jesus said there was never a prophet that the people didn't persecute. Yeah. Right. So these prophets like Amos came speaking the words of God, and they were not popular. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were not received. <coughs> people just believed the word of God. So yeah. it seems to me that the, the most important thing you can do is maintain your sensitivity to God's word. And sin will make you hard. Mm -hmm. Sin will oh, make yes. you hard. The second impression is, these prophets, Amos included, tell us a lot about God's governing of the nations. Mm -hmm. This is not the only Amen. place you read. There are lots of places in the prophets where yes. God talks about these other nations around Israel. Yes. And what he was going to do, and he raised mm -hmm. up this leader, and then he put this leader away. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this is a very common theme, and it shows God's sovereignty. And so, on a personal note... It makes me really want to trust in the sovereignty of God. Yes. Yes. Amen. So, the right. sovereignty of God is not just an intellectual <laughs> tenet of the faith. Mm -hmm. It's something we rely on. Yes. Amen. That's right. Because right. mm -hmm. what are we going to do about these big national yeah. crises? I mean, well, God's governing the nation. Amen. Amen. Yes. We can we can pray. We can ask Him to intervene. And we can trust that, that he's he's working out his purpose in the earth. Mm. Amen. Amen. Brother Ricky? Yeah, you know, the scripture says these things happen to them as examples. Well, that's true of Haziel, too. That's right. You know, you said that he had denied right. that he would ever do something like this. Well, if you ever wonder how far down mm -hmm. flesh can lead if you feed it, well, Hezekiah becomes an example of that. You'll do things you never dreamed you'd do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that mm -hmm. exhortation that says, "Make not provision for the flesh," mm -hmm. now that becomes that much more serious and yeah. grave in light Amen. of examples like Hezekiah and others like him that Amen. did things that are absolutely unspeakable. Amen. Mm -hmm. It was like when the prophet told him that he objected. Yeah. He said something like, "Am I a dog? You know, I'm yeah. serving a dog. I I could do, I could never do that, but he did." All right, we'll have a word of prayer.